Hello, my dear Hellspawn on the other side of the screen. <laughs> After finishing our small series on the subject of respect, I promised as a culmination to make a top 10 of those 10 people I respect most, who have significantly influenced and shaped me. The four video parts on respect were divided according to respect to parents, family, other people and worldviews. The following top 10 will exclude family and parents. Not because this is too personal for me, but because I also give some background information about each of the 10 and I would not want to do that with family members. But I can tell you that I have absolutely no respect for my two parents. From my so-called family, only my grandmother on my mother's side deserves and has wholeheartedly earned my respect, since she was the one who raised me. The top 10 will therefore only consist of people whose words and deeds have shaped me and a very clear picture regarding my worldviews and philosophy will emerge when you have heard the 10 names. Incidentally, the order of the names is arbitrary, except for the first three places. 10th place could also be in the fourth place and vice versa. But enough prelude. Let's begin. Number 10. Elias Canetti. Born in Bulgaria in 1905 as the son of Spanish Jewish parents, Elias Canetti, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1981, is one of the exceptional phenomena of his profession. His first novel, Autodafe, was published in 1936. In the 60s, he wrote several dramas and later on essays, travel logs, and articles before publishing his autobiography in several volumes, which unfortunately he did not get completed in his lifetime as he died in 1994 at the age of 89 years. However, his magnum opus, for which he deservedly got the greatest degree of recognition, is the book Crowds and Power, which was published in 1960. This is not a novel, but a complex analysis of human crowds. How do they arise? What are their rules? To what extent does the individual lose his individuality in a crowd? What are the different forms of crowds? Canetti examines these and other questions in his book and the aspect of the mutual relationship between crowds and a leader are also a big part of this. In the years between 1933 and 1945, Canetti of course had the opportunity to observe these effects in Germany from a distance from Vienna and London. The book isn't just a social study, but contains many more viewpoints from different areas such as psychology, ethnology and zoology. Because despite all our human arrogance, we must never forget that we still are not that different from our ancestors, the primates. And we have, of course, still inherited many of their instincts and behaviors, which always is clearly visible in crowd situations. Canetti's own experiences in 1922, during a demonstration on the occasion of the assassination of Walter Rathenau, and in 1927, during the mass riot in front of the burning palace of justice in Vienna, caused such such a fascination with mass phenomena in him that he intensively studied the subject for over 30 years. I'll give you a rough overview of his main thesis as Wikipedia describes them. In Crowds and Power, Elias Canetti defines four general characteristics of a crowd. Number one, the crowd always wants to grow. Number two, there is equality within the crowd. Number three, the crowd loves density. Number four, the crowd needs a direction. Canetti calls the psychological process which takes place within the crowd discharge. In accordance with Sigmund Freud, he develops the thesis that in addition to the basic needs of food, drink and affection, humans also have a crowd instinct through which the crowd loses its original negative connotation. Crowds appear as something natural and necessary. Canetti distinguishes closed and open crowds. Structurally closed crowds, for example, are usually the institutionalized crowds of churches. They have rules and ceremonies that intercept the crowd. There is a saying, a safe church full of faithful is preferred to the unsafe whole world. The institution is thus a taming of the crowd instinct. The open crowd is addicted to destruction and in modern times mostly free of religious aspects. It has the prime objective of growing. It needs a direction. 
a goal that lies outside each individual as well as a rhythm that ensures cohesion. In order to form a crowd, a crowd crystal is often required, a solid, stable group around which the crowd can grow. Another distinguishing characteristic of crowds is the carrying emotion. According to this, the agitating crowd, which aims to kill and can also be found in the animal kingdom, differs from the fleeing crowd, which is also known from the animal kingdom. The prohibition crowd, which revolts against the existing rules, which they don't want to follow anymore. The inversion crowd, which is directed against the former rulers. And the solid crowd. In addition, Canetti derives the human sense of power from the confrontation with death and the experience of survival. As always, when someone dares to question the status quo and draws lines of connection that have not been drawn publicly before, Crowds and Power is, of course, very controversial since it was released in 1960. For example, his thesis, there is nothing a human being is more afraid of than getting touched by unknown things, completely contradicts the presently preached mantra that we are a society which must be open to all strange and foreign elements. But a look at everyday situations shows that Canetti is correct with his thesis. In public, random physical contact with other people demands an excuse. In the elevator, people try to stand in a corner, look into empty spaces and keep silent so as not to get in touch with the other passengers. These are just two examples of many, which show that human beings do dread the unknown and strange. What makes crowds and power timelessly relevant and compelling is the fascinating deliberate consideration of collective processes and power structures. It is a basic concept in the literary work of Canetti to understand myths and ideas as something tangible. In this ethos, which demands adjusting your viewpoint towards reality again and again, lie the particular qualities as well as the specific issues with Canetti's work. Crowds and power is not an empirically verifiable sociological analysis. Crowds and power does not aim to explain, but only to describe. Diversity characterizes crowds and power. Diversity of sources as well as diversity of presentation. As a poet, Canetti translates mass phenomena into images as well as into power structures. It is precisely with his own words, far from the scientific vocabulary, that Canetti provides illuminating insights for laymen and experts of all kinds at the same time. Canetti who by the way, just like me, also detested ideologies, does not openly share his worldview. The major readers must gain knowledge on their own. Just as Canetti constantly approaches crowds again and again from new points of view, his work has to be re-evaluated again and again. I myself came into contact with the book during my literary studies and I was fascinated from the very first page. Of course, it is not the last word on this topic, but if you are interested, you should also read other works on the subject to get a more rounded picture regarding the analysis of mass phenomena and crowd behavior. But Crowds and Power is undoubtedly a must read for anyone interested in human behavior and for anyone who wants to better understand the development of political movements. Especially the relationship between people in power and the masses is very aptly described. And there are countless examples not only in recent history which confirm Canetti's thesis. Even today's global political situation with President Trump, Brexit, the rise of the right-wing populism and the simultaneous growing denial of reality within the progressive establishment can be made easier to understand with a glance at Canetti's work, which proves once more the timeless validity of his statements and the significance of this book. Elias Canetti has my respect because he has spent a significant part of his life exploring mass phenomena and their interactions and has conveyed his thesis and insights in crowds and power in a way which is also easily comprehensible for laymen. And he did it in a way which, as I said, is timeless and generally valid, independent of cultures. He thereby also supports my thesis, which I have championed since my early childhood, that the single individual, even if it is highly intelligent, 
is also capable of supporting dumb things in a group. And the larger the group is, the dumber things are supported by otherwise reasonable, intelligent people. The followers of our religions are a perfect example of this. Hence, the fact that Canetti was against ideologies of all kinds makes me like him even more, even if he was a difficult man. But most contrarians, who have swum against the current of the masses, were often cranky and unadjusted people, real individualists. And this brings us to number 9. Whoever occupies this spot, you'll find out in the next video. I'm looking forward to your comments. Like, dislike the video, share it in your social media, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and if you do not want to miss the next part, please subscribe. To be continued, count on it.